Well, first of all, I just, as I was worshiping back there, um, I was looking around. I was, I was actually like surprised at how many babies are with us. And um, I just want to give a shout out to the, to the new parents, to the young parents. Um, it's amazing. And uh, you guys are at church, which is amazing. That's a, a big challenge. And um, I, just, I just love that, you know, God the Father looks at us like his little babies. You know, and I really felt that in, in worship today, like Amen. he's holding us and, and he's embracing us. And we're coming in from the from the outside into a place where we can find rest and we can receive. And I wore this sweatshirt. Um, I actually found this yesterday in Target. Woo-woo! Um, but it basically says slow down and enjoy. Wow. And that's for you guys and for me because I need that too. Um and so with that, I just uh, want to kick this off. Um, again, Luke said uh, we've been going through this discipleship um, series. And the first week, we really kind of dug into um, what it was like to be a Hebrew and, and go through um, really discipleship back in the day. Um, but what I got from that at its core was disciples are learners. Amen. The second thing last week was high invitation, high challenge. And um, it kind of brought back some old teaching to me and, and brought it back into view. And, uh, and really, that's all about Jesus invites us into relationship, and then he challenges us to change. And so with that in mind, we kind of move away from um, kind of the more corporate-focused discipleship and into um, a segment of, of teachings that are going to be focused on our personal discipleship. Um, so we'll transition, and, and I just have a few questions for you guys. Um, do any of you guys find it difficult to hear or recognize God's voice? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I know. I was just talking to my daughter about this, and, and she came to me, and she, and she was like kind of scared to confess it, but she's like, Daddy, I, how do I know if it's God? You know, I feel like the most theologically complex times of my life are actually when I'm putting my kids to bed. They ask crazy questions. Be prepared. Be prepared. Um, <laughs> the next question, do you feel stuck or desire breakthrough? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then the last question, do you, do you want to live a transformed life? Yeah. All right, cool. We're on the same page. Cool. I'm glad. Um, before I dig in, I'm going to tell a story. Back in 2006 when I think I was 27. Any 27-year-olds in here? All right. Oh my gosh. Wow. We got a, we got a few. Okay. Well, that was 17 years ago for the record, Luke, old man. I got it. Thank you. Um, at that point in my life, um, I didn't believe in God. Um, and I remember, uh, studying to become a science teacher and I wanted to teach kids about science. I was super passionate about, um, the idea of, of being able to kind of share this, this thing that, seemed to make a lot of sense to me, um, you know, with young kids and to kind of help them in their way. And I kind of always felt like I had that teacher's heart, you know, inside me. Um, I remember walking the halls of my uh, science department and I'd see like uh, these articles on the wall about evolutionary theory, you know, versus intelligent design. And, you know, for a while there, it, it didn't really matter to me. It wasn't something that I focused on, but it seemed to be a hot debate at that point. Um, but since I didn't believe in it, it was like, well, who cares, you know? Um, and right around the same time, uh, I remember um, meeting this girl at, a, at a, a restaurant, and I got up the courage to ask for her number, and I got her number, and I felt like, you know, super cool dude. Um, and I called her up, and we started to hang out. And within like a few weeks, I, I found out that she was a Christian and we were kind of a dating interest at first and then it kind of morphed into more of a friendship. Um, but at that point, we'd have long conversations about uh, spirituality and science and everything in between. And I would get like pretty passionate with her. We'd be sitting in the car um, and we'd talk for hours. And I just remember how kind and patient she was with me. Um, but I was pretty much against what she believed in. <laughs> like, I was convinced that, that she uh, had a crutch for a, um, her understanding of life. From that point, um, as I started to walk through the halls again, I started to read some of these articles. 
and, and it was becoming more and more interesting to me, um, you know, this debate between, you know, science and, and God. And I remember one day I was in a geology lab, and one of the teachers was like, he was for sure a, discipleship, a disciple of evolutionary theory. This guy was so passionate, it was leaking out of him. And, and usually with teachers like that, I really absorbed that, you know. But in that particular day, as he was describing evolutionary theory, specifically that life kind of formed from primordial soup, and then it kind of, you know, figured its way out until today, um, all of a sudden I was like, this doesn't make sense to me logically. The first time ever that I really felt like this does not make sense to me. And I had a crisis of faith. Even though I didn't have faith in Jesus, I had faith in something else. And so from that point forward, um, I remember I, I went on a quest to uh, basically grill every professor that I had, one of which was my astronomy professor, who was a PhD um, astronomer uh, who worked at NASA. And I remember going into his office and scheduled the meeting and went into his office. And I said, what happened before the Big Bang? Like, do we know where the Big Bang came from? Because I don't understand how something comes from nothing. Like, and, and, and he looked at me and he was kind of like, he knew he was kind of in a pinch. <laughs> and, and I said, the Big Bang makes sense to me in a way. Like, I think I can explain that, but I can't explain that it came from nothing. Something had to start this. Um, and he said to me, well, that's where faith comes in. And he kind of said it in a sarcastic way. But to me, it was like, oh, wow. Like, okay, he's, he's kind of looking to a different source for that information because he was the one person I thought of all chemistry, yeah. geology, he was the one person that I thought could explain it to me. Um, from there, uh, as I was hanging out with Sarah, was her name, um, we decided to go to a party and uh, we went to this, this party and I was pretty excited because I thought there'd be beer there. Um, I thought there might be other things there that would be fun. Um, <laughs> and when we arrived, there were like kind of families there and kids and stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. Maybe there's some, you know, spiked Kool-Aid in the, in the, I'm not kidding you guys, this was me. And, you know, I'm like cruising through and I'm like, wow, this is super wholesome, you know, but not my scene, you know? Um, and so uh, in, in a little bit, she's like, hey, let's go play some volleyball. So we went, I know you guys are beach volleyball enthusiasts. That was me, 27. I was out there. Anyway. We started playing some beach volleyball, and as we were playing, I'm like, something is, is different with these people, you know? Something was different, and I couldn't put my finger on it. And within a, a couple of days afterwards, I realized it was kind of this aha moment of like, oh, wow, like, they were joyful. They were, like, naturally really joyful. It wasn't something you had to take, or it wasn't this hype fake thing. Um, and, and I felt really bad because I didn't have it, you know, mm. and it, it started to like cultivate this, this deep kind of disappointment and yearning in me that maybe was always there. I just never knew it was there. Yeah. I was filling it with other things and about, I think it was, you know, with, at least within a couple of months, um, I ended up going to my first church service, um, which was a big deal. I surfed a surf contest. I did well. And I remember afterwards, it was like, I, I was like, should I go with her or should I not go? You know, it was like these two lifestyles converging. Um, and so I went to this service. She invited me. It was trickery. She invited me to this service because it was at a club, a nightclub, where people did all kinds of nasty things. Actually, was, remember the Shark Club? My dad's back there. Shark Club. If you, the Shark Club was... They had a service at the Shark Club. There you go. The, sur the Shark Club was nasty. Anyway, I was like, this is a great place to go. <laughs> so walked in. I was like, pretty cool, you know. I was like, this is awesome. It looked like a nightclub. It was all dark and stuff. And, you know, a bunch of people back then, like, super hipster and stuff. And I'm like this. I feel like I'm at home. And then I remember that the pastor, Nick Taylor, started to preach. And I'm feeling all uncomfortable, people raising their hands and stuff, and I'm like, just wanted to flee. Um, and within a little bit of the message, I just came undone. I was crying. Um, I was like shaken to my core. 
And I'll never forget the message. It was the condition of your heart. And for me, the, the symbolism that he gave was like, our hearts can become this fleshy, beautiful thing can be some, become so surrounded by mud and roots and gnarled knots and all these things. And it takes time to chip that stuff off to get back to the place of softness of who we really are. And for me, I really feel like that was the first crack and I felt it. Within several months, I gave my life to Christ. Sarah and I did not go forward in a relationship, although we stayed friends. I met Jordan, my beautiful wife, at a Bible study. The last place I thought I'd meet her, at a Bible study, yes. And within a couple months after that, I proposed. And what happened after that is another story for a different sermon. But you can see the difference in seven to eight months of my life. And there was, you know, God was not on the radar. (laughs) God was so far off my radar. Um, And what I experienced, and I believe I experienced a lot of Kairos moments, but what I think I really experienced was in that particular condition of your heart, it was that was a Kairos moment for me. Um, it, It came in and it shook my core and I changed because of it. And that's the message for today. Um, Kairos involves uh, time. And when we think of, of time, there are actually several kind of Greek words that, are, that translate in time to English words. Um, one word English, time, but several words Greek. Two of those are chronos and kairos. Chronos is like what we do on our wristwatch. Um, I mean, Apple Watch is a little different, but it is the sequential time it it is goes in succession and kairos time is actually when an event comes in and disrupts the moment and actually suspends chronos time and so as we're going through this we're focused on these events um mike breen which luke had mentioned uh the author of building a discipleship culture and this discipleship group that i was in for about a year focused on a lot of these things that we'll dig into later called a life shape. But his uh, definition of Kairos is an event, an opportunity, a moment in time when perhaps everything changes because it is the right time. A Kairos moment is when the eternal God breaks into our circumstances, when an event that gathers some loose ends of our lives and knots them together in his hands. And so when you think of a Kairos moment, think of it as timely. It is something that comes in and it's timely. Mm -hmm. It's not chance. It's not random. It is something that's intentionally timely. Kairos moments can be positive. They can be negative. They're rarely neutral. And so uh, a positive example would be like the day you got married or the birth of your first child. Or it could be a family vacation that you went on. Um, an example of, of negative Kairos moments, it could be a, a divorce, or it could be a lost job, or it can be an argument you got into with a coworker or a friend. Um, when we talk about Kairos moments, consider them as impactful. They leave a mark. And so um, oftentimes what you'll see with a Kairos moment is, of course, the positive ones can kind of leave an indelible mark. But it's really the negative ones that, that can, can lead to opportunities for major growth and transformation. And so part of that is when a negative Kairos moment happens um, and, and these things start to well up, like let's say a lost job, right? It's that emotion that we pay attention to and kind of connect with. This is an opportunity for transformation, for growth. Luke mentioned earlier um, the anchor verse. It's uh, Mark 1, verse 14 through 15. After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The time has come. Timely. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. 
I was talking with Luke a couple days ago, and, and Luke reminded me of something that I read in, in Mike's, Mike Bring's book, which is a lot of people think that Jesus came um, and his, his core message was love, or his core message was, you know, um, take care of, of the poor, and these types of things, which are principles, and they're fundamentally important, right? But his, his, the theme of his message was the kingdom of God is near, right? And so in this, we think of a Kairos moment as the kingdom of God is near, right? And so I like how he puts it. This verse, which could be called a summary statement of the teaching of Jesus, says a lot more about learning than first meets the eye. In essence, Jesus is saying a great opportunity is available. God's kingdom is within reach for all of us. The kingdom of God is near means that if you reach in the right direction, your hand will disappear through the curtain of this world and reappear in the reality of the next world. There is a portal in time that we can't see and the inbreaking of God's presence is about to take place. So out of that book, we've got the learning circle. Make sure that goes up there. There we go. Thanks, dude. Um, and this is, this is an example of a life shape. Without getting like too kind of deep into the whole thing, the reason why they decided that it was important to try and develop a set of shapes was it, it was like, I think the example they gave was like Mickey Mouse. If you see a circle with a, another circle and another circle on top, it's pretty universally known that that's Mickey Mouse. Right, right. And then you can go down the whole thing and see like all these questions. What does that represent? Oh, it's Disney. Oh, who's the thing? Of Dis who's the CEO of Disney? Oh, it's this person. And like, so these shapes can contain a lot of information um, about a particular topic or principle. And so the same exists for these life shapes. In this particular life shape, we call it the learning circle or just the circle. You have a Kairos moment, which is when the kingdom breaks in and I want to make a, a really important distinction about Kairos moments as events that happen, that can basically happen and continue to happen, which happened to me. If you think about my story, I think I had, I didn't count them up, but I probably had maybe 20 or 30 Kairos moments. But it wasn't until one Kairos moment that I decided, right, or I was caused to repent and believe. And you saw movement, you saw a change. And so this particular shape is super simple. It shows us that the Kairos moment happens and we're caused to repent and believe, just like the verse says. To dig into that a little bit deeper, um, when we look at the circle, there's three things that we can see that it means. To live a lifestyle of learning as a disciple of Jesus Christ, how to recognize important events as opportunities for growth, and how to process these events. The discipleship process is dynamic. It's not linear. We think of sometimes, I think we can get stuck in the trap of salvation to heaven and it's a, and it's, and it's a straight line, right? But as we know, we've gone through this long enough. Discipleship is so dynamic and you have seasons of up, you have seasons of down. And so we need to be able to put something like this in place in our walk that's going to help us move through and not just be stuck, Kairos moment after Kairos moment, kind of missing it, but feeling it, right? And I think that's, I, this is not in the notes, but I think that's kind of what can happen to us in, in our walks. Christians across the world, right, is you get information and you think you're good, right? And then you see somebody kind of doing something and you're like, zap, I've got this information. But then they look back at you and they're like, I don't see you doing it, right? So there's that piece, but then there's the other piece of like, you actually don't get the benefit of transformation, right. right? You're just sitting with a lot of stuff in your head. I had a pastor friend, and I can say this, right, because this actually happened to me. Sat down, super frustrated, and was like, hey, I feel like I'm stagnant. I feel like I'm not going anywhere, and all this stuff. And, and he said, dude, you are probably one of the smartest guys I know. You have so much conceptual knowledge. He's like, but you are not good at practicing it. <laughs> I was like, dang, dude, that hurt. That cut deep. <laughs> and, and like at the time, I think I felt kind of resentful because I'm like, I am living this out, man. Like I am. And, and now I look back and I'm like, the reality was 
I see what he was saying. You know, um, this is not, this has not been my forte. I'm good at learning stuff and digesting concepts. I'm not great at putting a lot of that into practice. I'm good at sharing it, but I'm not great at putting it into practice. So I don't know if there's anybody out there that's like me, but you're in good company. Going back to Bren, the learning circle suggests a framework by which we can process what God is saying to us in the Kairos event and learn how to respond in a way that enables us to grow in our discipleship. This stems from high invitation, high challenge. I love that these things link up, right? This is, this is all planned. This is all part of the ride. <laughs> that Jesus calls us in, like I said before, into relationship, and then he challenges us to grow. And so he gives us um, this information about repenting and believing, not so that we can keep it up here, but so that we can move from our head to our heart and put this stuff into practice. Kairos, as, as, it's, as a word, is an event word, whereas repent and believe are process words. Right? So a Kairos moment, we can take it in as learning, but we have to move it into practice. The circle is a process. When we have a Kairos moment, we have to recognize that it's a time to step into the process. We cannot let it pass us by, right? We can, but it won't lead to good things. All right, you guys, so we're going to jump over to repent. Um, I don't know about you, but repent for me early on when I was going to church, it carried kind of a weird connotation. I remember street preachers like yelling, you know, and then people would come to our university and like yell, you, repent or you're going to hell. And, and so it, it took time to like have that be undone in my own mind. Um, I carried some baggage um, and it was triggering. And so I understand that um, repent in and of itself, um, you know, can be like that maybe for you guys. But I want to dig into it a little bit because for me, even for this message, I had to kind of like put it into its proper framing. Um, and so, uh, the Lunita Greek lexicon describes repentance as to change one's way of life as the result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. I love what John Mark Comer kind of says about repentance. I was like listening to one of his, his, uh, messages over and over and over and over before this, because I'm like, this, this is teaching me so that I can kind of like teach you guys in a way. Um, but he talked about repentance as reimagination. Yeah. He's like, it's, it's not so much this, this, you know, I've always heard like turn and go the other direction. He talked about it more as like reimagination and vision. And, it, and all of a sudden it became alive to me. Like repentance can be something that's, I don't know if it's fun but it could be engaging, you know, and not something that's scary and that feels like that carries shame and, and guilt with it. You know what I mean? Um, so Comer, reimagination is the first step to transformation because the lies we believe are deeply embedded in, embedded in our brains. Dallas Willard, um, one of uh, John, John Mark Comer's disciplers, um, describes repentance as the process of spiritual formation in which Christ is one of progressively replacing destructive images and ideas with the images and ideas that filled the mind of Christ himself. Spiritual formation in Christ moves towards a total interchange of our ideas and images for, for his. Um, that, I feel like, kind of frames this up in a spiritual context. And I, I kind of want to jump ship real quick and go to a scientific context. Um, so I became a science teacher, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing called neuroplasticity, um, something that about three or four years ago, I kind of became interested in this idea of like, how do we truly change? And I came across some articles and I read a book and started to kind of geek out a little bit in this idea that our mind is our control center. And from there, everything else flows, right? Our emotions, our thoughts, our behaviors, all of that yeah. starts in the mind. Yeah. And so this idea that we could actually transform ourselves through our mind. And so 
this topic came up. Um, one definition of neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change and adapt due to experience. It is an umbrella term referring to the brain's ability to change, reorganize, or grow neural networks. This can involve functional changes due to brain damage or structural changes due to learning. And so in, in a part of the functional neuroscience, um, of course, people who get into accidents or who may be born a certain way, they can actually work with people to change their mind and ultimately change their disability at times. Um, on the other side, on the learning side, we have the ability to do that as well um, in a bit of a different way, but I'll go into um, to that in a second. Um, one of uh, John Mark Comer's kind of reads kind of pointed me this direction. Dr. Kurt Thompson, he's a psychiatrist and a Christian author, talks about neurons that repeatedly activate in a particular pattern are statistically more likely to fire in the same pattern the more they are activated. Once the initial neurons in a network fire, there is a very high probability that the related neurons will also activate and move along the same bioelectrical pathway to the end of the network. The more frequently those patterns have been fired, the more easily they will fire in the same pattern in the future. That's why you may immediately recall the ingredients and, and steps to preparing spaghetti, which you make every week, but you need to consult the cookbook when preparing a holiday dish you haven't made in years. So we'll pull up some images here to kind of demonstrate this. As you can see the first image, think about the first time you have a thought. It's a virgin thought, right? And it, it would look like this, where you're walking through a jungle and there's a lot of stuff around you. And that thought is, is like that initial act of bushwhacking, right? You get some of it, but you're not gonna get all of it, right? The second time you think that thought, you're gonna go through and you're gonna continue bushwhacking, right? And then over and over and over, all of a sudden, it's gonna become a bit more clear of a pathway. That second image, right? Eventually, it's gonna become a completely worn pathway where vegetation is not gonna grow back, right? It's basically dead. And so this is an example of what happens in our minds. And this, this happens in good ways and bad ways, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that we have in terms of our neural pathways that lead us to good places and there's things that can lead us down the path to bad things. And this is basically our thought life. You know, Paul talks a lot about this, right? He talks about taking your thoughts captive and, and all of these things. But I'll tell you, like some of those verses make me so frustrated because it's so hard. <laughs> I mean, that's Romans 7 and Romans 8, right? Paul himself says, you know, I do what I don't want to do, but I don't want to do what I do. I don't know. It's all that stuff. And so I relate to that because it's tough. Um, but all of us get stuck in mental and emotional patterns, right? This isn't like you're better than this than I am or vice versa. Like all of us get stuck in this and it's, it's the way this thing works. And so as disciples of Jesus, that's why we have to have these kinds of conversations and we have to have some kind of a tool that gets us out of the ruts, right? When I was uh, just starting in church, I joined a discipleship group. Literally, like, within a few weeks. I'm like, all right, I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> um, I remember, like, the first meeting, I gave the disclaimer, hey, guys, I still don't fully know if I believe, but I'm here. And I would understand if you guys don't want me to be a part of this because it would take away from your experience. They went and talked about it. They came back. They're like, bro, you're in. And so I was like, thank you. Um, and so uh, a couple weeks later, um, I had to start memorizing scripture. The first one was, you know, the Great Commission. It's about being a disciple. The second one was Romans 12, 1 and 2, which became my life verse. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform anymore to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the re renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's right there. All I have to do is literally say that verse, and it's right there. But we'll keep going, because i got some cool stuff. Cool stuff coming. We're going to jump over to believe. A little bit softer <laughs> than repent, but it packs a punch too. 
One definition of, of believe, and this is in alignment with the Greek word pistis, is a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah, through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. And I'm just going to read a few verses um, from different areas of the Bible to kind of support this. The first is Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I don't know about you guys, but this, this freaks me out, this one. This is, this is like um, holy fear, you know, because I think even, even in our walks, this can still happen. I think about all that conceptual knowledge not actually transferring into my heart and going out as fruit into my life. And I've had seasons like that, and it can create conditions for destruction. Not that the Lord's like trying to do that to you, but we have a part to play, you know? The second one is James. James, of course, you guys know is a hard hitter. I like it. Um, do not merely listen to the, to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <laughs> Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues into it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Luke 8, 21. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and puts it into practice. That's Jesus' words. John 3, 13, 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. <laughs> Pretty straight, right? Um, all right. Next picture, please. Does anyone recognize this? It's a cookie. <laughs> is, is Gigi here? Do you recognize this? Okay, I searched far and wide for a picture of your cookies, and I couldn't find it, but this is pretty close. Last Sunday. Kat, are you here? You remember this. Okay. I have a witness. Last Sunday. I've been on a diet, you guys. I've been trying to shed some LBs, and, um, and I was starving. I, hadn't had, I barely had breakfast, barely had lunch. And I, I rolled in, and I look over. It's like, boing! And I see, G I see Gigi's cookies. Uh, and I'm like, man, those, those things are good. So I got some water, and I'm trying to, you know, take some sips. <laughs> and... Sure enough, I get up, and it was almost as if I, I wasn't conscious. I was conscious, but I was like, get up, walk around Jordan, and I'm like, you know, walking back. I get back there, I take two, put them in my little, you know, pouch. Then, then I'm like, take two more. I'm like, do mind if I do? So I take four. I go and I sit down, and I'm like, kind of. So Jordan doesn't see me. Cat looks over at me and is like, you know, gives me the cat, cat eye. She's cattle calling me. Jordan looks at me and she's like, and she reminds me, you are not supposed to be doing this. And I'm like, dang it, got caught. So a couple minutes later, I like get up, go get some water. <laughs> Went back over the cookies. I think I grabbed six. I'm not going to lie. At that point, I was already caught. Cat's out of the bag. I'm just going in. Wow. They, at that point, I'm not even getting looks from the girls anymore because they're over it, right? And then I'm just like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> what does that say? I know that I'm on a diet. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what I'm not supposed to do. I have accountability, <laughs> right? And yet... I love 
those cookies so much that I went in and did it anyway. And so what does this say about this teaching, right? Teaching is aimed at the mind, right? Practice is aimed at the heart. Teaching is aimed at the mind. Practice is aimed at the heart. Our mind might have the information, but if we're not putting it into practice, our heart can be deceived, right? And so another example of that is you come in on Sunday. It's an awesome Sunday. Worship's amazing. Pastor gives a great, great lesson, right? And you're just like, you're like, I'm on fire. I'm on fire. Afterwards, you're telling people, right? Monday morning comes, comes around and you're like, you wake up. You know, you show up in a a Gora and you're like, Brandon, I'm on fire. I'm still on fire, right? Tuesday comes along and it's like, you know, kind of like this. Wednesday, Thursday comes along and you're just like basically back to where you were, right? Is that, it? yeah, you got excited and that's awesome. But like something didn't happen in that process on Monday, right? Whatever you learned didn't necessarily get put into practice, right? And because it's tough, it is tough. And so I don't want to diminish that. Um, James K.A. Smith is a philosopher and wrote a book called You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. Writes, because we are what we want, our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behaviors flow. Our wants reverberate from our heart the epicenter of the human person. Thus, scripture counsels, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Discipleship, we might say, is a way to curate your heart, to be attentive to and intentional about what you love. Discipleship is more a matter of hungering and thirsting than of knowing and believing. Let me say that again. Discipleship is more a matter of hungering and thirsting than of knowing and believing. Jesus' command to follow him is a command to align our loves and longings with his, to want what God wants, to desire what God desires, to hunger and thirst after God and crave a world where he is all and all, a vision encapsulated by the shorthand, the kingdom of God. So good, right? Dallas Willard says spiritual formation in the Christian tradition is a process of increasingly being possessed and permeated by the character traits of Jesus. As we walk in the easy yoke of discipleship with Jesus, the teacher. You guys still with me? All right, cool. Let's get practical. (laughs) We'll look at another image here. Oh, yeah, you can go back. Sorry about that, Luke. Oh, it's okay. Um, yeah, I, for, I had forgot I split those. So the core question in here is when a Kairos moment happens, right, the question is, what is God saying? And then the answer or other question is, what am I going to do about it? What is God saying? What am I going to do about it? And so when we look at, this is just expanded out a little bit. It's the exact same learning circle but we see that the repent side has three steps, observe, reflect, discuss, and the believe side has plan, account, and act. For repentance, observing is looking at our reactions when something happens. Kairos moment happens, we look at our reactions, we look at our emotions, and we look at our thoughts, and we need to be honest in this moment, right? This is really tough. Jordan and I got in a bit of a conflict um, this last week. was tough. And it's like in the moment, in the moment you have a dog, like a dog in the fight, right? It's like, and then like after the conflict, it's almost always like you realize that, wow, maybe a part of what I, what I brought to the table is at fault or all, right? I'm at least 50% in, of this. And so I feel like in that moment, I, I actually believe that that particular conflict was a Kairos moment for me as I was preparing for this. And so the, the process of reflecting is the question of why we reacted that way, why we felt that way, 
why we're having these thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's discussion. This is the toughest part. I feel like this is where the rubber meets the road because you can, you can observe and reflect, but if you're not confessing, if you're not bringing somebody into it, it's going to short circuit the process and it's not going to work. This is a wheel and think of a, a, you know, I used to ride BMX bikes and if you had like broken spokes, like the wheel would not function properly and, and, and it actually could be in certain points dangerous, right? And so think of this wheel as all these steps matter to equal amounts. Um, the word says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. For believing, we have plan. Planning is pretty simple to get. It's just basically like, I think putting that time in to create, um, you know, a, a structure for change. You know, it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It could literally be like, um, hey, Gigi, I have a real weakness. Um, would you mind putting the cookies on the other side of the building? so that I don't have to walk, right? That's a plan. <laughs> a, I would be embarrassed if I walked across here to go get cookies. <laughs> right? Um, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That should be our planning, right? We go to him. Account or accountability. You know, Change doesn't happen in private. I've been so guilty of this, right? I go through these steps and I think like I'm there. I'm changed, but I didn't, I, I didn't bring it to anybody in, in this part of the process, right? Um, probably mostly because I was embarrassed or because um, I still felt shame, you know, or I felt like I was stupid or whatever, you know, um, or I was afraid to get caught, you know? That's a big reason too. Yeah. Um, actually, that's probably the chief reason why, for me, this this has not worked is because I was afraid to get caught. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those days I think it's happening a lot less. But um, action or act—that's just our action. We do it. We go after it. Um, the word says, "Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see." Faith is action. Faith by itself, if not accomplished by action, is dead. Yeah. Right? You guys tracking with me still? Okay, cool. I want to make sure. I know this is, this is meaty. Um, all right, I wanted to pull up this next set of scripture with you guys. I know it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but you can see what's in bold, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going to run through just a little bit of scripture. Um, it's it's a, a story about a moment when Jesus and the disciples went through a Kairos moment. And we can look at scripture and see it modeled for us. This is from Matthew 20, verse 20 through 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, John and James, and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? Jesus asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in, in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. <laughs> it was one of those moments I'm like, as I kept re reading this, I'm like, ooh, I wonder what that must have felt like. You don't know what you are asking. <laughs> um, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? And they said they could. But Jesus was talking about the crucifixion, right? He was talking about what was about to happen that they didn't know about. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. And so, you know, without going too deep into this, I think whether it was motivated by the sons or by the mother, that they were striving for a position of status, right? And they didn't know what was coming. They didn't even know that at some point that they would also die for the gospel. 
But Jesus did. And Jesus came into the situation and, and brought a particular moment of Kairos, yeah. right? So, so crazy. Next, we, we, or when the ten heard about this, the ten disciples, they were indignant with the two brothers. Emotion, right? A reaction. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. So Jesus discusses it and puts an example out there for them to chew on, right? And so they're working through it together. And in this case, I know Jesus is there, but for us, like, that's the conversation we have with Jesus. You know, it's, it's going to him. It's seeking him. Not so with you. Jesus says the plan right there. No, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you're going to do something else, right? Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's holding them accountable to the kingdom of heaven. And he's causing them to act in a different way. As we close up, you know, my heart in this is that every one of us comes in. I was sitting here last week in the back and I was just thinking like, God, like, what do you have for each of us where we're at right now? You know, some of us might be in amazing seasons, riding a really fun wave of life. Some of us might be in a season of rigor. I know we are. Young parents with young kids and full-time jobs and all kinds of crazy stuff and you just like barely have enough time to be close with each other, let alone time with God, you know? Maybe you're in a season where you're stuck. You're just in a rut and you need to bust out. Maybe you're in a season where the wheels have come off the bus and you're in a world of pain. I know that the kingdom of God wants to break in, right? For me, I mean, the stuff that I did and said and the Lord would come after me like he did in 2006, I mean, I could go down the list, you guys, and some of it I'd be like, you know, hope that you wouldn't think differently of me, you know, that he would come after me and cause me to even like, there's so much around me that caused it, you know, for me, it was just submission at a point, white flag, you know, Jesus lived a life worthy of imitation. And I think for me, that's like, as I grow older, I think that that's what I really want, is I want to live a life worthy of an imitation. There are a few people in my life that I really want to be able to look at me and be encouraged or caused to, to lean into the things that I've leaned into. And I feel like that would be success, you know? For all of us, the walk with Jesus is a walk of top to bottom transformation. That's what he wants for us is to, is to go from here to here with him. And I wanted to leave you with the last two images. Can you see those? One's a slinky. Um, this is the vision for Kairos moments. Circle to circle, to circle, to circle, expanding out. This is what I hope for you guys and I hope for me, is that we would put into practice repentance and believing so that we could grow forward consistently. What I don't want for us is to live a life on the merry-go-round. I hated those freaking things. They were the worst, <laughs> thrown off, 
people hurt. I'd get nauseous, the thought of it, right? But honestly, some of us are on the merry-go-round. And if you look around the merry-go-round, all, it's like, look at, look at how worn it is running around. That's us. We are, we're on a different circle, right? It's the worst. I've been in seasons like this. It's the worst. And so, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to, to share about Kairos moments.